question. Um, uh, and that is a question that we often get, you know, um, since five, six, seven years back. And when we go to uh, management conferences is, you know, why are you just doing, you know, something that has been researched in management sciences? Um, and the answer, in a sense, have been presented by Craig and by Alan, um, in the sense that for the last couple of years, we are working a lot on social emotional wealth which is the first theory that has been developed in the field of family business research, uh, because we have always been borrowing, you know, social exchange theories or uh, the theory of planned behavior. And so from all disciplines, we always borrowed. And then about, I think it's about now 12 years back, our colleagues um, have developed the social emotional wealth um, theory. And what it says, and Ellen and Craig also explained that in the report, is that um, family businesses um, in their DNA uh, put as much emphasis on non-financial goals or non-economic goals as economic goals. So um, I think it's important this morning also, um, the question was also posed to welcome when he presented, um, you know, the values of indigenous African family businesses. You know, why should we look at Africa? Why is it important? And it's important because um, the context is very different and family businesses, I think it was last year or, uh, yeah, or the, yeah, it was last year, Nikai, when you said in your presentation that the context in Africa is different, you know, um, and, and Craig also referred to that in a, in a European context and a US uh, context, you know, some of these family businesses are old and uh, they're wealthy, you know, and so family businesses, uh, provide sort of a social net uh, for many other ills in, in, on the African continent, you know. So we sit, actually sit between a third world um, uh, continent and a first world continent in terms of, you know, even our research. So on the one hand, we research SMEs that don't even know that they're family businesses. They don't use that concept. And on the other hand, we have very wealthy longer generation family businesses. So I think it's important. Um, and we have three studies currently and two of them will be presenting tomorrow. So I really want you to invite you because it gives a lot more insight into the role of social emotional wealth on certain topics. So the, the one um, research project is a student, she's not presenting tomorrow, but she's looking at the role of social emotional wealth on um, CSR, so um, uh, customer um, relationship pro or uh, uh, CSR practices. And then tomorrow, William will present, and it's very interesting, on the moderating role of, of social emotional wealth between the enablers of innovation and innovation output. So he has done a quantitative study, he's busy with his results, very interesting. And then um, tomorrow, Sanele Siswe, she's currently in Hamburg, but she's from um, Soweto in South Africa. And she's doing a PhD, and Ellen and Craig will find it interesting being from KPMG. She's doing her doctorate on integrated reporting as a trigger to transformational organizational change among listed uh, companies in South Africa. And there she's also looking at the influencing role of socio-emotional wealth. So it's really solid methodology, solid research that, um, you know, don't just say it's, it's interesting, but also to look at it from a, a particular context, you know, is it really as important? And I think the answer is yes, because um, we cannot compare ourselves, even in South Africa, even in Africa, you know, if I compare a, a family business in Nigeria, it might look very different, the same size compared to one in South Africa. So. Yes, the answer is it's very important for, for the context and to better understand and go into more specific details and to learn from, you know, bigger samples or interviews, um, how do they perceive these constructs? Very important. Thank you, Amory. Um, I'll ask Alan, Cray, Oliver and yourself this question. So the report indicated, sorry, welcome. Would you like to speak? Uh, perhaps, perhaps to please, to please. add on. Thank you. Perhaps to add on to what Prof is uh, been saying, because a family business is a marriage between two systems that often uh, 
pull in different directions, the family itself and then the business itself. Uh, we, we investigate or we do research in family businesses because of the family effect that is brought by the family influence on the business itself. It brings a complete dynamic uh, and, and whether it's within the context of Africa or within other contexts uh, outside Africa, I think the family itself uh, as an institution that it could be structured in different forms and shape does provide us an, a reason, I think a valid reason for us to investigate uh, family businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, to Alan and Cray and then to Oliver and um, Elmarie, if you can provide your comments in that order, please. So the report indicated that 25% of family businesses reported high level of entrepreneurial orientation in their companies. So how do family businesses keep this entrepreneurial spirit alive? Yeah, that, that is a very, very important question as well, if I can just add. And I think if you look, number one, I think it's what I said earlier, it's about that engagement. So, so how do the next generation learn from the senior generation in terms of the entrepreneurial path, their story? They, you know, they started these businesses from, in many cases, from scratch. And at the same time is to share that and communicate that. But that the, the next level is how do you then enable the next generation to experiment, to go and make their judgments, to, to, to take the risks, but in a, in a, in a structured way. In other words, you know, they, they're given the opportunities and not just to follow what the senior generation has done. And I think those families that impart that at an early stage and, and then put processes in place to enable the next generation to, to do that because the world is changing so quickly. And I think they've got some really great ideas, but how do you give them the opportunity to make the mistake? Because let's be honest, that's the greatest um, way to learn is to make those mistakes but at the same time not at the cost of the family business and 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 therefore to drive and bring ideas and to explore that etc so you know those are the things and just coming to back to what Elmery said is what we're seeing as well you know you're seeing a lot of legislation and focus on let's say ESG you know environmental and there's a lot of reporting in Europe but what we're seeing in African family businesses or saying, you know, what is right for the business and, and doing it not as a tick box approach, but really as this is our role in the community and how do they share that with the next generation and, and connect with them. So I'll hand over to Craig because I, could, I don't want to talk for too long on the topic, but I think those are the two fundamentals is, is the, the senior generation share their story and at the next give the next generation opportunity to go and make the mistakes to innovate because they could take the business to another level. And I mean, I'm not going to add a lot, speak, uh, but I mean, I think that's one of, I mean, welcome, you mentioned it earlier about the, the dynamics that a family brings to a family business or to the corporate side of it is that ability to give the next generation a little bit of freedom to explore and take those risks. That's one of those competitive advantages and those differentiators between a family business and a non-family business. Because in a non-family business, your structures don't allow that, that, that little bit of agility and flexibility um, to let the next generation bring their ideas to the table. Um, and that's, for me, is, is, is also coming back to the first question in terms of why do we study a uh, family business versus a non-family business? So I'm gonna stop there and let the, the rest of the panel share their thoughts. Awesome. Oliver, please. Thank you. Let me come from the perspective of challenges first. Uh, to say what challenges do we encounter in family businesses uh, before we can speak about regeneration of the cell. So uh, there is a founder, there is a founder in the family business. Founder or founders, it can be a wife or the mother, I mean the mother and the father before they can then give the business to the kids. But the motivation, the motivation for starting the cell might be different for the kids that are going to inherit the same business. So we need to go to the founding stages and say what motivated the family to start the business. 
And you find that because our kids are now being um, provided for, they might not have the same motivation that the parents had. So they may not be able to sustain the business in the same uh, trajectory that the parents would have uh, anticipated. But what then other colleagues have said is for the parents to then say, uh, we are going to tolerate failure. We are going to encourage you. We are going to work with you. We are going to nurture you, but you are going to tolerate failure. But the question, like one of the colleagues said, the question is to what extent are you going to tolerate the failure? Um, because at some point you need to win the kids uh, to take over and grow the business. So there are issues to do with risk taking. What might have made me take risks might not allow my kids to take risks. Uh, what might have allowed me to see an opportunity might not allow my kids to see the same opportunity going forward. But we need for them to continue recognizing new opportunities, to continue innovating, to continue taking risks, and we need to nurture them. So these are the dynamics uh, that I saw welcome to, uh, what I was also talking about. These are some of the dynamics that we encounter in the family business. The gap between the founders and those that are going to take over the family business and taking it forward. So we need to continue to expose the next generation to the challenges and opportunities that are inherent in the environment for them to then capitalize and exploit and grow the business going forward. So how do they do that? They need to continue to innovate. They need to continue to, uh, to rely on entrepreneurial intensity. You know, we said Sorry, Oliver, we seem to be losing you. Your connection seems to be weak. If they leave a gap, like it's more to them be able to support the next generation. So I think um, I'll leave it to other colleagues. I'll come back uh, with other. Lost me? We can hear you, you now. Sorry, we, we lost you for a little bit, but we can hear you now. Thank you. Elmarie, please. Uh, okay. um, I want to support what um, Oliver has said. Your question was, how can you um, nurture the entrepreneurial orientation within yeah, family no, that's business? That's fine. And entrepreneurial orientation is actually not a measured as an as a individual level construct. It's actually firm level construct. And that's where family businesses um, is important, you know, and they make a difference. And William tomorrow will present the whole issue of what we call the innovation paradox in family businesses. Because on the one hand, as Oliver referred to it, family businesses, you know, have sometimes more resources, they have shorter decision making channels, so they can go for an innovation and be more innovative than non family businesses. But in our research, we have also found the opposite, you know, because they long term orientated because they moderate risk takers. Some some people have found that they're not more innovative than non family businesses so uh, and that's where the nature of family businesses come in that secret source. You know that's one of the and Ellen and them being involved in the SEP project, um, the, the, the other circle of the step project um, refers to the family resource pools. And one of them is knowledge and the transfer of tacit knowledge. It's knowledge that you can't see. It's knowledge that has been created and experienced over years. So in my opinion, one thing that family businesses can do that non-family businesses can't do that easily because the, the workers change, employees change um, as time goes by is to transfer, make sure that that secret recipe, that tacit knowledge that has been built over one, two, three generations, been transferred, as Alan said, from a young age. You know, the families that do get it right um, in the step cases that we have done that successful, do that from a young age. So they make sure that the children are not only educated from a, from a technical point of view, 
but that tacit knowledge that that gives them the competitive advantage is transferred from a young age thank you thank you alan please so I just want to add to what Oliver says is 100% right, right? The, the hunger that drove the founder to build the business is very different to the third generation stepping in. But you got to make sure you manage that entitlement and that environment to in order for the business to grow. Because as we all know, there's a lot of information, there's a lot of stats, how quickly that business can be destroyed. And I think that next generation needs to understand that but at the same time, making sure that the business continues to grow to sustain the family and not the other other way around. And I think you know, the, 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 the advantage African family businesses have is that we can learn from the Europeans, Americans that have been down this road so that we don't make the same mistakes. You know, that I think is fundamental. And exactly what Elmery said, we've got a different we might have a slightly different recipe, but how do we deploy it to make sure that the, the generations continue to grow? Because they're so important for the economies of our respective countries. We we have to make, but we've got to maintain that hunger. And and what Oliver said is 100% correct. And maybe if I may carry on with that is, I mean, obviously it's important in terms of keeping that entrepreneurial spirit within the family, but Omri also talking to your point, it's also at a firm level that sometimes it may not be within the family and getting an external CEO or someone who's got that entrepreneurial spirit in their DNA to come in is also a, a recipe for success where you don't always just keep it within the family. You've got to have the right person for the job at the end of the day. Um, and that's also a dynamic coming back to Welcome's comments earlier in the sense that Sometimes it's not the family members, but everyone thinks it should be a family member. Um, so I think that's just also an important point to, to note that. And it also talks to what Oliver was saying. If the third generation doesn't have the, the hunger, that's when a non-family member may be the one that you bring in um, to drive the business at the end of the day. Thank you. I'd like welcome. Um, the report indicated that an authoritarian or paternalistic leadership style appears more among CEOs from the Middle East and Africa and parts of Asia, with the global trend being that it's the least prominent amongst the survey respondents outside of Middle East and Africa. This is quite an interesting finding and it may be insightful for everyone to share their thoughts as to why in Africa, the authoritarian leadership style may still be prominent. But to you, welcome specifically, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. Wow, that's a that's a huge one. Um, I think I'll answer this, you know, in two levels. Uh, the first level at a macro level. Um, you know, leadership has long been, you know, uh, been one of the main constraints on political and economic uh, progress in Africa, and we we are having a lot of challenges because of leadership. And I think you all might agree to that. Um, and there, the this uh, problem has got some anthropological and sociological background in the field of African culture, where leadership is mostly seen um, as, you know, um, cementing the power and the influence of other people. Uh, so we see authoritarianism and pater, paternalistic uh, you know, leadership, uh, even though it makes businesses stable and organizations stable, but it does have obviously have some you know, effects, negative effects over the long term. So uh, at a macro level, the issue of uh, people not knowing separation of power, the culture, you know, uh, the culture of, um, you know, of, of, of suppressing others um, and not having governance system, et cetera. And I'm using this the macro system or the macro description because family businesses are themselves a microcosm of the societies in which we come from. So at a macro level, that's what we have and our family businesses in the context of Africa more or less represent or 
imitate what we have. At a micro level, uh, I think there are two responses that I can that I can look at here. I looked at the report and the presentation from Craig and Alan. I think they they, they beautifully uh, explained this, in, you know. But what I see is that uh, a lot of family businesses in the context of Africa are still owned and managed by, you know, family family members or family CEOs or family whatever. Um, and, and which is not the case in most of the, let's say in the world developed countries where these businesses are managed or run by, are run by non-family non CEOs. That has got a bearing on the family business and how it does because a family business owner or the founder has more of a, an attachment to the business than the non-CEO who might have a different perspective of the, about the business. And I think from uh, the KPMG report, it also came out so evidently uh, and, and loud for me that those businesses that are managed by uh, you know, non-employees, uh, non-families, family members tend to then prefer transformative leadership style uh, as opposed to authoritarian. The second response to this that I think, and here I'm just using my anecdotal evidence and my thinking, uh, is that if you look at the demographic, uh, demographic factors of the business itself, uh, firstly, we have to acknowledge that a lot of our African family businesses are still young. Uh, from I think Prof. Harrington would know this, a lot of these businesses are also small businesses that perhaps employ maybe if, if they are really big in the context of Africa, that could probably, you know, 200, et cetera, you know, employees. So the demographics of the family business does also have an impact. If, uh, if you look at the maturity of the family business, uh, because the family founder is still there present in the operations of the business, in the making of the decisions, they tend to want to have control and exert that control and want to be, that control to be, to be felt in how the business is managed and run, as opposed to a family business that perhaps um, might have, uh, you know, have been there for quite a long time. Again, in terms of demographics, also the one aspect which I'm going to stop there is the issue of gender. Uh, in terms of family businesses, a lot of family businesses are run and owned by males, simply because males have been have been been in the context of Africa, have got access to means of of doing things, uh, uh, economic you know things. So, uh, as we know, men generally. Uh, I was talking last week about uh, at a fuck out event on the Women's Day. So perhaps I must, I can also add this, that uh, there's, uh, you know, men are known to have masculinity and want to dominate uh, and they want to exert again that power, that authority over others. And, and the, the, the voices that seems to emerge and being heard is that of uh, entrenched in masculinity. I think that's my response to that. Thank you. Thank you, Alan, please. Yeah, no, I couldn't, he's 100% um, correct in terms of, I think it is the level of maturity of the family business in Africa versus, and, and the, whether it's non-family or, or family, but I just want to make one, that is the preferred leadership style. So I just want to make it very, that we mustn't beat ourselves up, it's not that, Middle East and Africa are the only ones that had authoritarian. There's certainly a lot of authoritarian leaders <laughs> and leadership styles in the, the established country, but this is what is being preferred. And specifically, because it's non-family um, run is, is what's leading to that in the current context and environment. So I agree 100% with welcome. Great. And Elmery, please. Yeah, um, I perhaps can, and Shelly perhaps can, if she's there, um, um, can jump in, but, um, and welcome as well.
but last uh, when Tony Machaba Ove um, finished his PhD, uh, it was similar to that well, what Welcome found in his PhD in the sense that you know um, masculinity, paternalistic culture, even entrepreneurship um, innovation was they saw it as different. If I, I if I just took something like innovation, I remember that Tony. You know, in, in, if you go strictly according to the academic definition of innovation, it must be a new product, new service, new process, whatever, organizational structure. But if you, if you ask family businesses in Africa, if they're innovative, they will tell you, of course, because, because of colonization and um, laws, they were not, for example, be able to buy a business over the border or um, run businesses in their own country. So uh, all that I want to also mention, I think we need to be very sensitive how we operationalize, how we define a concept, because many businesses will tell you definitely in Africa, they're very innovative, they're very successful, they have high performance, but they don't meet the traditional definition of innovation or entrepreneurial orientation or even paternalistic culture because elders play such an important role in African businesses. I'm specifically talking about the black cultures, indigenous African family businesses. They don't see it as negatively as we do. They see it as a, uh, we found that in Tony's study, they, they, they find it as more respect um, then for us, um, paternalistic is almost negative, um, just as masculinity. You know, yesterday, um, I can just mention that I was driving to another meeting and Bettina Engelbrecht is the first black CEO of a well-known retail group in South Africa, the Clicks um, Retail Group. She speaks perfectly Afrikaans. Uh, she's a black woman, so she def and she also said, you know, people think if you're the CEO of a company, you need to be masculine, you need to be tough, you need to, you cannot make, and and you know, she's a servant leader and she's a participative leader. So I think the the world is also changing, and it's um, I, I think there's other underlying values like Ubuntu that's very important in African cultures. And, um, you know, it might not meet the traditional definition in a Western context, but it, it, it's still there. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and linked to the topic of leadership governance, is there a reason for the surprising statistics that only 59% of the respondents have a formal board of directors in place? And how does this compare to the comparative for Africa slash South Africa? Um, Alan? I'll jump in on this one. Okay. <laughs> Please Alan do. doesn't mind. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I think, it, no, it, it is a very surprising statistic. And um, I think what it 100% agree, it, it talks to what we look talking about now, been talking about in the sense that because of that emotional connection with the business, um, what you generally find, especially more your first generation, second generation family businesses, your boards are going to be there, but it's going to be more family members and not your formal structured board that, that one would expect to see to, to ensure um, it's an effective board. And because of that emotional attachment, a lot of family businesses don't want to give up the control. And as soon as you have a board, that control can get diluted and you lose that agility and that nimbleness that a lot of them feel as potentially, if one wants to use that term again, authoritative um, leadership, they want the full control. And as soon as you go to board, you don't have that full control. So maybe that's one way um, that that st statistic coming off. And, but, I mean, it's also, um, comes down to what is your trade-off between that agility, that full control, and actually ensuring that you're mitigating the risk and growing the business for the future of the family. And I think that's what a lot of the family businesses are, are missing in the sense that, sorry, just to come back to it, I spoke about first generation and second generation um, uh, family businesses not potentially having a board. I mean, if you look at the, the statistics um, of the, the number of family businesses surveyed, 80% of the respondents were first and second. 
So from their perspective, that's why I'm giving that response in the sense that they still very much emotionally connected um, to the family business. And then I think on the flip side, if we look at South Africa and Africa, it's actually an interesting um, discussion to, to have because it's actually, a, it, it runs the other way. Because our local regulations require a formal board in South Africa and Africa, you'll, probably, you'll find a lot of the family businesses have it, have um, formal board structures. What the key question is, is, is it just a board to tick the box to meet the regulation or is it actually an effective board? That's an imperative con consideration that we are having discussion with family businesses around because if you've got a board of just family, me family members, is it an effective board um, or, or, or all of those family members just saying yes to whoever that authoritative leader is. Um, and I mean, an interesting um, report that's out there by the Serdar Group is that they show that your effective boards, your companies with effective boards will outperform any board that just, uh, any company that just has a board to tick the box. Um, and sorry, the Serdar Group, this, their, their annual reports are all around private companies, which includes family businesses. So it's also interesting to see um, that if your regulation requires a board, which South Africa and Africa would go against the trend that the report's showing. Um, but for us, the key question is, is it an effective board? Um, and then one's got to talk to the family businesses because it is very difficult for them to move away from giving up a little bit of that control is what is the positive impact of an effective board? Um, and we spoke about it on the previous question is they may bring more more entrepreneurial orientation or innovativeness because they've got experience from outside of this family business and they bring it into the family business. Um, yeah, and obviously any good governance mechanism will mitigate risks because sometimes family members um, will also help mitigate those emotional um, discussions that sometimes happen where family members forget what hat they're wearing. Are they wearing the hat as at a governance level, at a um, CEO level or at a family level. Um, I'm going to stop there at that level. Maybe I just want to add there, what, we, what we're seeing is those families, and the CERDAR report also proves that, where there's greater diversity in the board, including gender and ethnicity, there's a direct correlation with a strong performance. Family needs representation. And, and we've even seen with, seen with our own clients where they bring in an independent director to the board in fact, that doesn't even understand the industry. The questions they're asking, which has never been asked, is allowing the board to think totally differently. And there's, they sing so much value and they don't understand why they didn't do it earlier um, in terms of bringing. So the board is not red tape to prevent them from actually, it actually helps them actually drive the business forward by asking different questions. And I see in the chat, there's a question on whether the non-family CEO leadership could could dilute the SEW. I don't think it will, provided that the family that are engaged at a governance level continue that is that that social emotional role that they play. It doesn't mean that when, when there's a non-family family CEO playing that role. But even if you bring a non-family direct on board, the value that it can bring is significant, as opposed to bringing a family member on just for the sake of them being a family member. They could actually have significantly larger detrimental effect to the business just because they're a family member and they've been put onto the board. Omri, sorry, if you don't mind me jumping in before, <laughs> um, just to talk to Alan's point and the question that was raised, that non-family CEO, 100% agree with what Alan says, and you can also manage that socio-emotional wealth in terms of how they are groomed into their role as a non-family CEO so that they also understand and align with the family values. Um, so that's how you manage diluting that social emotional well. Sorry, Elmer, I just wanted to add that in. Now you took the words right out of my mouth. So thank you very much, Greg. <laughs> now I wanted to say, I want to support both uh, gentlemen um, in the sense that I think it depends. Social emotional wealth can be diluted, but it can also be increased uh, depending on which dimension of ECW you're looking at. So you will lose more control, 
which is a good thing in in terms of governance, business governance, and you know even family governance. But I think you will gain in terms of you know your your relationships because a non uh, uh, you know uh, if you bring in an outsider on a board or in governance, you know you oh. immediately I think increase your credibility with the outside world. Uh, and even inside, you know, nepotism is still at the order of the day. So I think um, in some ways you will definitely um, perhaps dilute your social emotional wealth, but then for most other dimensions, you might increase it. Um, yeah, it's it's a fascinating thing. That's why I say it's actually a fascinating theory to um, look at because um, Sanele Siswe tomorrow will also talk about that you know um if you if you look about integrated reporting ellen and craig you will see that some aspects of of social emotional wealth can be negative in terms of um that all aspect while others can reinforce and bring change so it it depends as you say craig it depends on if this if this cultural configuration or compliance between the non or the outsiders and the family members. Um, I think that's very important that whoever you bring in from outside can also live with the culture and, you know, how the business culture has been formed. So I think these things become very complex, but uh, that's a very important point you made. And maybe just to talk to them, and I don't know if you were thinking the same thing, um, but sometimes that non family CEO does strengthen it and actually allows the family the ability to remove very tough decisions. I mean, we had on in our conference last year or two years ago, I can't remember, a non-family CEO who had to fire a family member from the business. And if you had a family CEO, sometimes they wouldn't make that decision and kind of just put them somewhere else in the business where this non-family CEO, he had the mandate and he was able to fire them because it was having a negative impact on the business and the family relationships as well outside of the business. So, I mean, coming back to the question about diluting SEW and the positive, the negative, I think that's also a good example. Great. And on the topic of SEW, the report refers to a combination of performance factors for family businesses. And in light of the fact that social, social emotional wealth is a key KPI for family businesses, what are your thoughts on how can family businesses measure their performance? I'll give a few points and then allow the panel to go again. Um, so yeah, I think quantifying any form of performance um, is challenging in, in, in a normal um, non-family business. But as soon as you bring that family element, it obviously does add complexity. Um, and as we spoke about, I think in the presentation and, and through the discussions we've had, it's, it's about the sustainability of your family business. And the financial results are very important because as we know, finance will drive anything at the end of the day, but it's maintaining that founder's vision. You said the entrepreneur orientation and the reputation as responsible owners is just as important. So Alan had the one slide where it broke it out into financial performance, entrepreneur orientation, non-financial performance, and then your social performance aspects. So in terms of measuring those, I'm not gonna to talk to the financial performance, I think, most people know about that, but Alan did touch on when it comes to entrepreneurial orientation, you're looking at the actions around um, what kind of research and development are you doing? What kind of digitization are you doing? You're, the family business and the board within the business needs to ensure that they are taking steps or, and potentially risks that are high, maybe maximizing profitability and actually making competitors, forcing competitors to respond to whatever decision they're making. So become the influencers in that industry, if I can put it that way. So from an entrepreneurial orientation, is, it's that risk aspect. From a non-financial performance, is trying to measure the unity and loyalty that you create within that community that the family business is in. Um, and that's comes through, I suppose, in terms of the reputation that we build and we've touched on earlier as well, and making sure that, as Alan mentioned earlier, there are those training grounds or communication channels where those the family values, the beliefs, and the value system is being passed on, not only to the next generation, but communicated to the community as well um, around it. Um, so you create that 
um, socioeconomic circle um, within the community that the family business operates. And then from a social performance, you've got the external and internal factors. Your external factors are your ESG, if I can use the, the phrase that uh, um, uh, everyone's using at the moment. But part of that is also educating your stakeholders and it's your stakeholders within the business and outside of the business and showing them. Um, and I think the question was raised maybe earlier today in one of the earlier sessions is how much should you be showing the outside world in terms of the good that the family business is doing? And for me, this is what the social performance and how you measure that is, is about communicating it um, to, to, your, um, to your community. And then, yeah, I think, um, but I think one important aspect that did also come through the report as well is that the CEO of the business doesn't have to be responsible for all of these um, performance measures. The CEO generally focused on your ESG and your financial aspects, but you've got to identify who within the family needs to be, who's best suited and should be reporting on these other aspects as well. Um, because it's only the family that can really report on the non-financial aspects that impact the family as well. So I'm sorry, I just I want to, I just want to, yeah, I just want to add to what Craig is saying there, and I think that's where you can actually create greater connectivity and glue of the family by having more involved in the the non-financial aspects, and especially the impact they're having in the community on the environment. I mean, a lot of these family businesses, it's been part of their DNA for a long time. They are aware of the impact they may be having on the environment and what do they need to do about it uh, purely beyond the compliance aspect. But how do they share that? And it'd be interesting on the integrated report, I mean, because that's that's the whole thing the listed guys are sharing beyond the financial results. But I think there are many families that are doing beyond that. And how do they do it in a very simplistic but powerful way of the true value they adding to the community beyond just the financial aspect. And I think, you know, that I think is a, is a key aspect. And in fact, we've done some work on that as well, but that that environment was easier to measure. And what Craig said is, you know, you, you do what you, you measure, you manage what you measure. And if you're measuring it and you're sharing it, mm. that is how you can focus on that. If, if I can add and, um... Yeah, I'm now going to say something very controversial, but that's why you need strong methodologies. When you investigate all these complex um, constructs, you cannot just interview two people and say, okay, this is now all, that is now the viewpoint of all family businesses in Africa. And um, the person that I've asked the question is Raymond, and Raymond just started his PhD on innovation adoption of digital, digital innovation adoption framework. So that's quite a mouthful. Um, but yes, a very strong uh, methodology, the same with welcome, the same with the other, um, you know, researchers. Um, so one must be very careful, you know, to um, just talk to three fa families and say, okay, this is how it is. And that's why we need conferences like this, where we have you know, the cross fertilization between people who's in practice like Alan and Craig and other people that's on this panel and Phyllis, I think will be tomorrow. And um, I don't know if Oliver is still on, but that's why we need cross fertilization where we say, okay, um, you know, use it in practice, but you know, we have to have strong, um, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, methodologies to test this. We cannot just, I, I read, often I read reports and it looks very nice, but it's based on 20 businesses or, and then you cannot generalize. Uh, so the more information we have, the more interviews we do, and it's still very scant. It's very, very um, limited still in Africa. And that's why we need conferences and you know, cooperation like this is that we need both. We need we need to generate more knowledge. We we only see the tip of the iceberg. It's only the last couple of years that we start researching in Africa. And uh, Cassidy, our master student, is now doing um, a systematic literature review and a bibliometric analysis on what has been done the last couple of years on family businesses in Africa. You know, so that we can say, okay, there's still a lot to be done in this area. Um, succession have been researched quite a lot, so we know enough. Let's go to something else. 
So yeah, I, 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 that's really, I'm, I feel very strongly about that. If, we, if you want to do strong ethical research, you also need very strong methodologies behind that. Um, Maria, if I can just comment quickly on that. Um, I was fortunate enough to be at the Africa CEO Forum in June uh, on a family business panel and, and, and managing a workshop around philanthropy. But what was quite interesting, I found from all the family business leaders that were there is they are working a lot more with the European um, advisors and tertiary institutions. And it's quite interesting because they're saying that the baseline learnings that they're getting are really good, but they're struggling to convert it into, as we've been talking about, the Africa cultures. And that's why, I mean, I totally agree with you, is we need more from an Africa perspective where we, the Europeans and Americans and everyone else, we can learn from them, but we've got to be able to adapt it to our cultures um, because that's a, a massive differentiator. And, and been sharing, so just, uh, just to share the results and the insights, because I think, like you said, Omri, it's just, just encouraging people to share information for the benefit. It's, it's no other than helping them learn from one another, right? And I think I agree. There's, I think if there's one takeaway from this conference, we need more African output, if I can call it like that. Indeed. And there's a question in the chat box linked to that from Victor. What opportunities are available for collecting data on family businesses in Africa? Are there publicly available data sets on family businesses in Africa? The short, short answer is no, Victor, that's the problem. Um, for every single research project we do, um, we need to build up a database from scratch. So whether we work on succession or copreneurs or entrepreneurial orientation, and it was so nice. In 2020, we joined Alan and Craig for the African Barometer. And uh, we eventually presented the paper, Alan, Shelley, and I, um, at the international conference, just on the data, you know. So, so we're not so interested in the report, but we're interested in the results. So you have to join hands. That's very, very difficult. Even um, to get listed companies um, to do research on them and to know if they're family businesses, it's extremely hard. You know, we have access to these databases, but we're not, uh, not like Europe, know exactly. This is a family business. This is the board members, blah, blah, blah. Which family members sit on that? We don't know that information. So you, uh, the short answer to your question is the opportunities are still limited. Uh, at the unit, we have built up a database, but again, you know, uh, the, the addresses change, the emails change, so every single, especially the quantitative studies, we have to build up from scratch, and welcome perhaps can also tell you, he had seven family businesses in his studies and did interviews, uh, I think four or five members in that business, and it's not easy. Um, it's it's time consuming. It's um, some family members will just say to you, "Chuck off," you know, and um, they're very secretive. Um, especially if you start asking them on any financial issues, just even if it's their perception, they're so worried you from SARS or you're going to report them to somebody. So welcome can also perhaps share that, but it's not easy. And in a family, you can have very approachable family members and others will just say, sorry, I don't have the time. Um, and that's perhaps the person that can help you. So, yeah, Victor, if you can come up with solutions, it will be highly appreciated because um, that is a struggle. Thanks for that. Um, during the last answer, you were talking about digital revolution. I wanted to unpack that a little bit and based on the findings from the report, um, from each of your perspectives, who is leading the digital revolution within family businesses? I don't know who'd like to go first. Alan. Yeah, let me take that first. What was interesting, maybe just to go back, is the Europe seems to be the highest in terms of regional, in terms of who's driving the level of digitization. And and in link to that is actually the non where these non family CEOs in the business they seem to be driving it because probably they've got you know experience elsewhere they're more favor that so so they realizing the importance and 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 once again that transformational aspect in terms of driving it but interesting enough 
uh, and, and seeing that as Women's Month, it's interesting to be discussing this. It seems to be the females, female CEOs of the next generation are certainly the ones uh, that are being more aggressive and and leading this this change versus the their male counterparts. And uh, you know, uh, and it, and it's fascinating. And I think they they're not only talking about the softer issues. And I think Welcome referred to that, but they actually look taking on these harder issues, uh, specifically digital, which is not easy. You know, having uh, doing a digital implementation and transformation of a business is really not easy. And and they are tackling it and doing it and being very successful at it. So you know, those are the interesting things. And I think within Africa. Even last year, or well, two years ago during COVID, we saw that there's this massive drive to 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 drive the digital aspect in order to, for their businesses to happen. But yeah, Europe's leading the non CEOs from that perspective, and and the ladies are are certainly driving that aspect. So that's in a short answer my uh, feedback on that. Helen, can I ask a question? Something that I pick up in practice, perhaps you and Craig can can and Oliver can comment on that. Uh, and even um, Nikkei, perhaps you can comment, but what I find is that in some regions in South Africa, I can only speak for South Africa, you know, there's sometimes big family businesses, but they geographically far away or relatively um, geographically uh, 200 kilometers or 300 kilometers away from the cities. And what they're telling me is that they really struggle to get uh, good financial directors or people that can do the finances or, uh, you know, even something as uh, like a dairy manager. So it seems that that is becoming a huge problem that that it's very hard. And I think, Ellen, a few years back, you talked about how do you retain the skills? So your first price probably is to retain or educate a family member that can come back, you know, that have a vested interest and that can run with that. But that is something I don't know how you pick that up. Um, is it something that you also see? And how does families overcome that? Because I find that's increasingly a problem in, in more rural areas, in more remote areas that they struggle. Even the children don't want to come back um, because they say, oh, but I, I get very lonely and I don't I can't get a wife close by, whatever. It sounds stupid to us, but it's a reality for the younger generation. So I don't know how you find that and how that could be overcome. No, uh, Maria, I think you're 100% right. I mean, you must remember as well, if you just take the financial role, which is fundamental, which is really key and, and is an important partner to the business leaders and to the family, if you've got a really strong financial person, whether they're family or non-family, I think the challenge we're having in South Africa, whether it's family business or not, is the opportunities overseas. Number one, forget about rural versus city, is, is that's the one aspect. There's a number of dis disruptors in the financial space. Um, and then also, obviously, the city versus the rural and, and the pay difference is, is a massive aspect for that set of skills. So, what we're seeing is those large family businesses are, are investing in that. They say, look, we have to match whatever is getting paid if we want to attract. But it's not only the financial aspect. How do you how do you show the lifestyle aspect as well? And 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 the you know, I think many professionals are getting jaded by the professional lifestyle and the professional corporate culture. And therefore, that is what families need to start advertising if i want to call like that and encouraging to say this is what we bring in i can tell you i know a, a ceo at a corporate that is moving to a net as a ceo he's moving i mean a large business but he's being in a large corporate multinational and he's taking the opportunity to move to profit because of the the broader aspect but at, once again he's got a family and it's all that lifestyle and therefore you you can be in that role for many many years you don't not looking over your shoulder when when you might be cut. So, but it's but it's not only it's finance, it's IT getting that is even that is even more difficult to get a, a strong IT uh, CEO, CIO, et cetera, to help with the digital transformation. You can't do it remotely. But what we've seen with COVID, people wanting to get out of the cities, different cha total change in lifestyle. So I think the opportunity is now to target those professionals where there's a skill, but once again, encourage the youngsters to, 
to go into that road, but it is going to need time to to have a to have a handover. So it does depend on it. But it'll be seeing family businesses in rural areas being successful in attracting top talent. Uh, but you need to pay. Unfortunately, that that is the one thing that will need to come with it. There needs to be that as well. Oliver, are are you back? I see you back on. Um, what is your take on this? Yes, I'm back. I'm back. I've been lost. Yeah. So, so that's a difficult one. Um, you, it's, it's dicey. You need to balance it. Um, I, I can give an example of a guy that I know who was educated in America. The father's intentions was that when he comes back, he becomes the chief operating officer. So he comes back and he, he confided in me and says, my father is, does not listen to my advice. Uh, but he's brought me all the way from USA back to run the business as CEO. So I'm going back to America. So he went back, he got an opportunity in the Wall Street and is working there. So what, what you, we, uh, you experience with that kind of setup is you move one step forward and two steps back as a family business in terms of capacity building. So especially in critical skills like your IT, like your finance that you're talking about. So, um, and you, you may not be able to be in a position. So it's, it's so dicey. Uh, remember we're talking of a business that's, that's 200 kilometers in the rural. And it, obviously its performance might not compete with the ones in the cities. So they can't also compete for the same skills. So that's, that's a dice one. You need to, to, to work with mediocre uh, kind of skills and hope for the best. And that's a challenge. So just, I just want to add that the, you're right. You, you, if, you, if you're going to work with mediocre skills, there is a massive risk to the business. And, mm -hmm. and even if you, if, you, if you have people there, how do you invest in them to up their skills? So you might not need to retire, uh, hire someone from outside. But if you've got people in the community, how do then do you help them get to the next level and invest in their education? Because you know they'll they'll be um, they'll be more solid and loyal from that perspective. So it's they investing in them as well. So I just wanted to to add that and getting a mentor. You see more and more people mentoring and getting someone maybe and virtually it might be a, a good opportunity to to mentor the people virtually and there's digital CEOs or CFOs etc. Well, thank you so much. We are out of time and I see the comments and other questions, but perhaps we can pick up a couple of these um, tomorrow. Um, we'll be talking tomorrow about upskilling, which is what you were just talking about now, Alan Barr. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Thank you all for tuning in today and look forward to joining us tomorrow as well. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, thank you Nikkei. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.